If you have not uh, been around lately, you should know that we've been working our way through the book of Matthew, and we're quite a ways through it. We are in chapter 24. Today we're going to be studying verses 15 through 44. Chapter 24 is known for being a chapter about the end times. And we started last week with that chapter, and I encourage you that if you were not here last week, please, I strongly implore you to uh, go back and watch that when you have the the chance. Uh, Today, the title of the message is Ready or Not, and I'm loving these uh, AI-generated claymation backgrounds for the last two weeks. I might just keep using these things. So the element of surprise. When, that's a phrase that we all know, and it's normally used to describe something that we, we want. It's, it's known as a good thing, right? When you think about military strategy, you value the element of surprise when you're planning an attack. You want to catch your enemy off guard. Uh, maybe they're sleeping. Maybe they're distracted. So you attack at those moments when they least expect it. And maybe you manufacture the distraction yourself, right? A, a diversion, right? And... So you want to catch them flat-footed. Some examples in history, the sack of Rome in uh, 410 was a a big surprise to the world. The Battle of Trenton in 1776 was another one. George Washington led 2,400 troops troops across the Delaware River and caught the British completely off guard. The Battle of France in 1940 was a huge blow because apparently, I didn't know this, but before that, uh, most of the world thought that France had the strongest army in the world. And their reputation changed dramatically after that. And we all know that it has stuck. Uh, Let's see, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor a year later in 1941 almost took out our Pacific fleet. Huge surprise. The Six-Day War in 1967, where Israeli planes surprise attacked the Egyptian Air Force, destroying hundreds of planes, and then troops on the ground marched into the Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip. And of course, more recently for us, the attacks on September 11, 2001. Uh, A very vivid example of the element of surprise. And for us Westerners, it seems that Western cultures tend to take surprise attacks as, you know, shocking and even dastardly, especially when they're against us. But it's not the case in other cultures, like the Chinese culture, for instance. They tend to just blame the uh, victim for letting down their guard. David Graff said that in the Chinese language, that it, there is no equivalent to fool me once, shame on me, fool me shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. But if there was one, it would be fool me once, shame on me. And that's it, you know. But generally, the element of surprise is valued in military strategy, in storytelling and entertainment, like comedy, you know, it's a big deal. Marketing and business, element of surprise is a good thing. In, in general, surprise has a strong psychological impact. And, but is it a good thing in regards to Jesus' return. There's a big difference, though, right? A military is trying to surprise the enemy in an effort to harm them. And that is not what Jesus is going to do. Like, so it would be counterproductive for a military to announce way ahead of time what they're planning to do. Yet that's exactly what Jesus does, okay? Even though we are going to see that there is an element of surprise and to some degree to his return, He's not actually trying to surprise the world. He's telling them way ahead of time, here's what I'm planning to do, because he wants us to be ready. But unfortunately, most of the world continues, even 2,000 years later, to not be prepared. But he's coming, ready or not. And last week, we studied the characteristics of the Christian life leading up to Jesus' return. This week, we're actually going to look at the characteristics of Jesus' return itself. And we have to get a bit technical today. And so you're going to need to pay attention, follow along, because we got some things that we're going to have to to work through, some interpretation issues that we started with last week because we were looking at, okay, 
Some people start, they look at this chapter and, and they think it's all about the past. They think it's all about the destruction of the temple that happened in the year 70. And then others are like, some of it's future, some of it's past. Others are like, it's dual fulfillment. Others are like, it's all future. And so as we work through our passage today, I'm going to deal, continue to deal with those issues. Uh, and we're going to work through like just a little bit at a time with the teaching elements. And then we're going to get into the takeaways. But before we jump in, let's pray. God, we ask that you would help us to to think well this morning, Lord, to focus. God, help us to not be distracted. Uh, Help us to, hopefully we're well rested this morning after gaining an hour. Uh, We pray that we would see what you want us to see in this passage and let it uh, change our lives. And every time we dig into your word, Lord, there's something that can change our lives in some way. So we pray that you would give us ears to hear, hearts to understand, and um, humility also, Lord, because we we study these things and we know that we can't hold on to um, our expectations about the end too tightly. Because we could be wrong, but we should be prepared no matter what. And so we pray for that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start uh, just with verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. So last week was the first 14 verses, and we dealt with these birth pains that Jesus talked about. And my interpretation is that they have been happening throughout all time since Jesus left, but they will also potentially escalate dramatically when we near his return. And then he goes on to say, talk about the abomination of desolation. Now, a lot of people, like I said, consider this to be all about the past. And so I'm going to point things out as we walk through it. This part here is actually phrased differently in Luke's account. So he says in Luke 21, 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that its desolation has come near. And you read that and you're like, oh, okay. So that completely sounds about like what happened with the destruction of the temple. And so there's, but I'm not saying that Jesus isn't talking about the destruction of the temple. I'm just saying that I believe that he's not only talking about the destruction of the temple, that we have a dual fulfillment happening. But in order to believe that, you must believe in a literal tribulation. Like that, that's a, a given. He talks about Daniel. In the book of Daniel, Daniel talks about a ruler who's interpreted as the Antichrist, also known as the man of lawlessness who will make a covenant with Israel for one week and in the middle of the week will turn on them and desecrate the temple. Well, later in Daniel, he says that from the time the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. And for this to have a future fulfillment, it requires that we interpret that uh, kind of those days literally, really. I mean, you could say that they're figurative, but it's still in the future. But there needs to be a literal tribulation for that to have a future fulfillment. And another thing that would have to happen is that Jewish people would have to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Now, if it's all figurative language and if everything's been fulfilled already and Jesus could come back at any time, then, you know, all bets are off. But we also should think about what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And you know that what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. 
For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. And so Jesus could be only talking about the destruction of the temple. Paul could be only talking about things that happened in the past, but I think it's hard to read it that way. Uh, or what we could see is a dual fulfillment and kind of a, a, a full circle to where we get another temple and another abomination of desolation, so to speak, that's connected to the Antichrist. So it's hard for me to see how, when you look at Daniel, how the, the covenant portion was fulfilled already and how what Paul talks about here is fulfilled already because the appearance of his coming would have to be the destruction of the temple and I think that's really hard to swallow. It's a, a big stretch for me. So let's continue in verses 16 through 22. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not come down to get things out of his house, and a man in the field must not go back to get his coat. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Pray that your escape may not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For at that time there will be great distress, the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now and never will again. Unless those days were cut short, no one would be saved. But those days will be cut short because of the elect. So again, some troublesome statements that we're seeing if, we're, if this is all about the past. Now, some will point to the part that says, and never will again in verse 21. And they'll say, there it is. That's proof that this is about the past, that it's not about the tribulation. Because why would you say that if it was about the tribulation? Because it would be a pointless statement. Because, of course, things will never be worse than that because Jesus is about to return. But I would say, I, I don't find that a very convincing argument. Because I'm like, well, if Jesus is trying to say that he is talking about something that's coming later on, uh, further in the future at the tribulation, then he would have to say something like that. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a clue. And that's the clue. And so, because if he's talking about the worst time the world will ever know, well then, for one thing, in order to believe that this is only about the past, then you can't really believe in, in a tribulation. Uh, it doesn't work. Or you have to believe that the tribulation will actually be not as bad as that time, which if you think that Revelation is talking about the tribulation, then you're like, that can't be the case. Plus, he says that no one would live unless those days were cut short. And this seems to be him saying that no person at all would live. Like not just no people in Jerusalem, not just no Jews, not, or not even just no Christians or something about that. And so why would that apply to Rome sacking the temple in Jerusalem? That doesn't make sense. But uh, if, however, the book of Reve if there is a tribulation, the book of Revelation describes the tribulation, and you look at the seals and the trumpets and the bowls in, the in, in Revelation, and you read what happens there, you're like, well, that makes perfect sense because those things could not go on very long and people continue to live. <laughs> it has to be a short period of time. Now, John MacArthur has an interesting translation or interpretation of the days being cut short. He takes it even more literally, not just that they end like the time ends early of that period, but actually the days being cut short. Uh, like because in Revelation 8, 12, the fourth trumpet strikes a third of the sun, moon and stars and makes the days a third shorter. And then in the bowl judgments, the fifth bowl plunges the beast, the Antichrist kingdom, into darkness, which most of the time we, we would look at that and say, OK, that means his kingdom is falling like it's failing. But uh, MacArthur thinks, well, this could actually be the days being cut short, actually, you know, the days being shortened. And then even at the end, for a very short period of time at the end of the tribulation, there being no daylight at all. And that being a contributing factor to the protection of believers during that time in some way. I don't know. It's interesting to think about, though. But we'll continue in verses 23 through 28. If anyone tells you then, see, here's the Messiah or over here, don't believe it. 
For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Take note, I have told you in advance. So if they tell you, see, he's in the wilderness, don't go out. Or see, he's in the storerooms, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will gather. Again, for this to only be about the past and the destruction of the temple, then you have to interpret that as being the coming of the Son of Man. Which is, I think, a weird way to describe it and a hard way to interpret it. But then verse 29. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now here again is where it gets even harder, you know, to think about it as not having a future fulfillment. And some will take verses 15 through 28, which we had had just read. And say, those are separate from verses 4 through 14, which we covered last week. And they'll say 4 through 14 is about the future. 15 through 28 is about the past. And now in 29, Jesus is jumping back to the future. And he's talking about after the distress of those days, which is the birth pains that we read about last week. And others will say, no, it's all about the past. And what they do with that here in verse 29, they'll take poetic and figurative language from the Old Testament. You know, talk about the sun darkened, the moon not sheds light, stars fall from the sky, powers of the heavens will be shaken. They'll kind of individually take those out and show in the Old Testament how that kind of language can be used to describe other things that could have been fulfilled already. But the problem that most people have with that is that you have to isolate the phrases. But when you put them all together... It's very apocalyptic language, and it's very reminiscent. It's the same stuff that we read about in Revelation. But then some people make Revelation mostly all about stuff that happened in the past, which I think is just a really tough pill to swallow. So I told you we have to get through some technical stuff today. you got to pay attention. But verses 30 through 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. The language seems very much indicative of the second coming. And for those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, I'm, I'm going to, well... I'm going to focus on you guys mostly next week, and we'll, we're going to dig into that systematically. But I'll say up front, I do not believe in a pre-trib, pre-trib rapture, but even for those who do, uh, this isn't it, right? Like if you look at verse 31, gathering his elect from the four winds, if you believe that's about the rapture, then guess what? You believe in a post-tribulation rapture. <laughs> Because he just said, after the distress of those days, after all of this stuff happens that's described of the tribulation. And so you, you got to pay attention to context. Verses 32 through 35. Learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Verse 34 is the hardest part of this chapter to interpret. But first, let's deal with the fig tree. Now, some people have taken the lesson of the fig tree and said, that's about Israel becoming a nation again, which has already happened. And so that's why once Israel became a nation again, we started to see new, a lot more new predictions about when Jesus would return. Because they were like, oh, that's the fig tree. Summer is near. It's this generation, you know. And so it's the generation that saw Israel become a nation. But that's taking it out of context. When you consider the context, it's much better to read this as Jesus saying that when you see these things, as in the birth pains and the abomination of desolation, 
then you know that things are close. And so the birth pains we know to a degree have been happening all along, but we can maybe expect them to ramp up significantly, and we might recognize that. Uh, of course, now, when Jesus said, when you see these things, don't be alarmed. The end is not yet, but it is getting close. And it would be within a generation. So this generation could mean the generation who sees the birth pains when they really ramp up and who sees the abomination of desolation. Or it could be that everything's about the past and this generation has to be about the past. So it was fulfilled with the destruction of the temple. Uh, but I think it's not a far-fetched idea to say there's a dual fulfillment. He's speaking to that generation at that time, and they are going to see these things fulfilled in a way. But then there's a future generation that's going to see these things in a different way. Verse 36. Now concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, except the Father alone. Uh, we're going to keep reading, but pause for a second, just because one question that I've only found one other person who ever even asked the question, and it was one of the uh, commentaries that I read this week, because I had been asking the question. And something that people don't ask is, okay, that was true at the time that Jesus spoke it, but did it remain true after his death and resurrection, after all authority had been given to him? Does it still remain true today that Jesus doesn't know the day or the hour? And a commentator was talking about that, and he was like, I had that question, and I asked a, a bunch of, you know, Bible experts, and they said, we don't know. And that's basically what we would all have to say. We don't know. Is it still true that he doesn't know? I don't know. But as the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding grain and with a hand mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, be alert since you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Again, we see here a couple of verses right here that people apply to the idea of a, a secret, left-behind style, pre-tribulation rapture where people just disappear and nobody knows what's going on. But pay attention to the context. That is not what that's about. Uh, look at here. Look at what happens. To be taken in this context here is a bad thing. You're being swept away for judgment like the people were swept away in, in the flood in the times of Noah. So in these verses, uh, you want to be left behind. <laughs> you got to look at the context. And then verses 43 and 44, the last part of our chunk of text today. But know this, if the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he would have stayed alert and not let his house be broken into. This is why you are also to be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, I am later going to get into the thief in the night thing. And it, it gets misunderstood. It gets misused as well. But I'm not, and I'm not even saying, and I'm going to deal with this next week, but I'm not even saying there's no possibility of a pre-tribulation rapture. But the thief in the night is not about that at all. But now let's, let's get to our takeaways. So last week we looked at the characteristics of the Christian life leading up to the return of Christ. But what are the characteristics of his return that we can know for sure from this passage? And the first one is that his return will be obvious. Look at the language. As lightning from the east comes from the east and flashes as far as the west. Uh, where the carcass is, the vultures gather. Again, a sign of like, it's going to be, you're going to see it. It's going to be obvious. 
The sun will be darkened, the moon not shed its light, the stars fall from the sky, the powers of the heavens shaken. It says, all people will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet. This is an event nobody will miss. It will not be a secret. And I'm going to come back to this when we get to how we should live in light of these truths. But second, it will be awesome. And, and those two go together. But, you know, something being obvious and being awesome doesn't always have to go together. It might be obvious that you got a haircut. It might not be an awesome haircut. <clears throat> but this will be awesome. The world will stop in its tracks. Jaws will fall to the floor. Eyes will widen like you've never seen them widen before. No one will care about what they were doing before whenever Jesus returns. Third, it will be sudden. That's what verses 36 through 44 were all about. Jesus likens it to the days of Noah. People will be eating, drinking, marrying, and, and, and seemingly just kind of living life. And, and you might wonder, well, wait a second. If there's a, a tribulation before this happens, and the tribulation is described in Revelation, uh, then how could that be? Because it seems that it, life would be anything but normal. <laughs> after all of that. And you're right. It would be anything but normal. And I'm open to the reality that, uh, you know, my understanding could be completely wrong entirely. Uh, so I hold these things uh, loosely. But I also think that that would be taking the illustration too far. You see, even if things get as bad as they are described, people will still live in denial. They will still be in rejection of the truth. They will still reject, they will shake their fists at God. Or nowadays, we'll see a lot of people just think it's climate change and they're like, well, we did it. We, we've gone too far. There's no turning back now. So just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. You know, and, and they'll be living in denial. We should look at 1 Thessalonians 5 1 through 3. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Sudden destruction like labor pains. And they will fool themselves into thinking that there's peace and security, but it's just an illusion. And, and they are under a delusion, which is why we need to go to 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. There's a delusion that people are going to be under. We should expect during those times people to be delusional, which shouldn't be hard for us to imagine because that seems to be the way we're going anyway. Uh, it's becoming commonplace. It's kind of trendy right now. So there are signs, but it will be a sudden event that catches the world off guard, even though Jesus told us what's coming. But it won't be... It will be completely unexpected by most, but also expected by some, by those who follow Jesus. Now, the world won't see it coming, but Christians should. Now, we cannot know the day or the hour. We can't, we're not going to know exactly when things are going to happen, but we're going to know that they're coming. We know right now, regardless of what we believe about the millennium and all of that stuff, we know that he's coming. We're ready. And I don't think it's appropriate for anyone to try to calculate Christ's return. Some will say, well, yeah, we can't know the day or the hour, but we can get the year and the month, right? And that's, that's not the right attitude. Like, that's not what we're meant to do. The only way it would ever be appropriate to even think that we have some idea of a timetable is if we, for sure, we would have to be in the tribulation, we would have to see that we're in the tribulation, and then we would see the abomination of desolation, and we would be like, okay, I think we can kind of get a timetable, a rough estimate going on here, three and a half-ish years. But 
until we could see that clearly, any speculation about when Jesus could return is at best um, unwise, misguided, distracting, and at worst, blasphemous. But let's talk about the thief in the night. Jesus says, if the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he would have stayed alert and not let his house be broken into. This is why we're supposed to be ready. That's the point of that language. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, we read, Paul said, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And a lot of people just kind of leave it at that, and they, they, they take that, and they're like, oh yeah, the, the left behind rapture, right? But no, you need to read verses 4 through 8 of the same chapter. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. You see, the whole thief in the night thing, the point is not to teach people that there's some secret, mysterious rapture that could take you at any moment. It's to contrast a world who's delusional, and when Christ returns, will be completely taken by surprise, will not see it coming, will not be ready, to contrast that world with Christians who are prepared and who are not surprised. Even though we don't know the day or the hour, we recognize that He is coming, and we recognize the seasons. We learn the lesson of the fig tree, that summer is near, and we're prepared. So Jesus' is coming will be expected by those who follow Jesus, and completely unexpected by those who don't. They won't know a thief is coming, but Christians will. Christians won't know the exact time, but they'll be prepared, just like Noah. Right? He talks about like in the days of Noah. What did Noah know? He didn't know a lot. He just knew there was a flood coming. God said, build an ark. I'm going to flood the world. So he starts building an ark. He takes a long time to do that. And he's just like, he, all he knows, a flood's coming. He's telling people a flood's coming. They're like, you're crazy. And then seven days before, God's like, get on the boat. In seven days, I'm sending the rain and I'm flooding everything. And all that time, Noah didn't know. All he knew was a flood was coming. And we don't know exactly when Christ is coming, but we know he's coming. And, and that's why this applies regardless of whether a premillennial, postmillennial, or all millennial person is right. We should be prepared no matter what, because he's coming. And maybe. Seven years before he comes, it's like seven days before Noah came. He's like, hey, <laughs> it's about to happen. I don't know. So these characteristics that we've looked at so far, those are for sure. Those are absolutely, we're not wrong about those. The last, I've got one more before we get into how we live uh, that is less sure. And, but it's still worth talking about. See, Jesus is coming it might be, but is probably not imminent. Like, what does that mean? Imminent means that it could happen at any moment. That there's nothing that needs to happen beforehand for Jesus to return. But understand that for Jesus' return to be imminent, you cannot believe in a tribulation. A, a literal tribulation period. That doesn't work. Uh, none of the stuff that we've been reading can be about the future. He said in verse 6, these things must take place. Verses 15 through 26, he's talking about these things will happen. Verse 29, immediately after the distress of those days. Again, back to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Paul says, that day will not come unless these things happen first. And so if he's talking, if he's not talking about the destruction of the temple, then 
Jesus' coming cannot be imminent. Now, people will say, well, yeah, his second coming is not imminent, but the rapture is. All right, well, we'll deal with that next week. <clears throat> but I believe that certain things must take place before Jesus returns. Uh, now, how should we live in light of these truths? Well, first of all, we should not be led astray. Jesus says, guys, I told you in advance. So when false messiahs and false prophets rise up, uh, when even performing great signs and wonders, don't be led astray. And if Revelation is about the future, then that, that's exactly what will happen. Chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Great signs and wonders. Jesus talks about it. Revelation talks about it. See, the only thing, we can't just be led astray by false teaching, but also by false signs, false wonders. But... Jesus made it easy for us to not be led astray because he said his coming will be obvious. And if it's obvious, then we shouldn't be led astray by someone coming along and saying that it's happened. So somebody comes along and says, hey, did you, Jesus is back. He's in the woods. No, he's not. Jesus is back. He's in the storage room. I don't know why he used that language. but No, he's not. Somebody says, oh, look, did you see the video here? Look, Jesus came back in Jerusalem. No, he didn't. If he was back, I would know it. Everyone will know it. We might not know the day or the hour, but we should know the signs, the seasons. Learn the lesson from the fig tree. When you see these things, recognize that he is near. And it's not okay to go about trying to predict Jesus' return. It's not okay to give our time and attention to people who do that. But it is perfectly fine. And, and if my interpretation of things is right, it's actually part of being obedient to Christ to understand the seasons. We should not neglect what Scripture says about the end. We shouldn't gloss over it. We shouldn't be like, oh, you know, I don't really, those parts aren't important. Yes, they are. We should approach them humbly, hold those convictions loosely, understanding we might be wrong about any of it, but we must not neglect what he says about the end. Some things are for sure, like 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insecurity, in, insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Or 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. You post-millennials out there, I don't know where you're getting it. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. See, those things, those are for sure. Very explicit in the last days, this is what people will be like. Avoid those people. But then there's other things that aren't as for sure. It depends on <laughs> whose interpretation is right. And if a premillennial interpretation is right, then some things that we would expect to see would be the reestablishment of the nation of Israel, which did happen. 
Some people don't believe that's relevant. They think that the church is the fulfillment of everything left for Israel. So there's no actual, there's nothing left for ethnic Israel, but only for spiritual Israel, which would be Christians. And that's understandable. I, I, I can see where they come to that thinking. Uh, I don't share it, but I'm not saying it's impossible that they could be right. But other things that we might would see would be an increased hostility toward Israel, like really increased to the point where like no, they basically have no allies left in the world. Um, a rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem and an advancement towards a one world government. Not necessarily that every nation or group in the world is, is on board with it, but a general like world global kind of power. So what should we do? We should recognize. We should expect Jesus' return. We should be alert. Anything more is really to our detriment. Because even these other signs that I'm talking about, even if we see those things happen, that wouldn't give us a timetable. We still wouldn't know. It could take way longer than we expect. It could come way quicker than we expect. Which is why the parables that are coming at the end of 24 and then throughout chapter 25 are about that. But what we should do is cling to the words of Christ. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will never pass away. It is Jesus' words that we cling to. Not mine. Not Billy Graham's. Not John MacArthur's, not John Piper's, not R.C. Sproul's, not David Jeremiah's, not some guy who was on the internet saying that he knows who's going to win elections, or the, the prophets who knew what would, uh, when COVID would go away. Those are not the words that we cling to. Not even the words of people who come and call down fire from heaven in front of us. But we cling to the words of Jesus. It's his words that determine how we live. And we should be alert, ready at all times. No matter what signs we think we see or we don't see, we could be wrong about stuff. We don't know exactly how things are going to work out. But we must be prepared so that even if Jesus does come today, he doesn't catch us off guard, asleep at the wheel. You see, next week, I'm going to systematically cover the tribulation and the rapture. I mean, we're just going to study. I'm going to go, you know, over arguments for and against certain things. We're going to look at different parts of Scripture. And we're just going to cover a lot of the normal questions that people have around that. Because I wanted to do that before we move on in this chapter and get into chapter 25. Uh, the week after that, Chris is going to be preaching. And in the week after that, we're going to start to look at some parables where Jesus helps us unpack more of what does it look like to be alert, to be ready at all times. And maybe that week or maybe the week after, we're also going to see what is Jesus going to do when he returns? And I'll give you a hint. Judgment is what he does when he returns. And the only people who are ready for that day are those who have turned from their sins, repented, and put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And not just with their mouth, but actually follow Him as the Lord of their life. They're actually committed to Him. Those are the only people who are saved. Those are the only people who will be ready for His coming. And if you have not done that, then you are not ready you will be swept away like the people in the flood. And I don't want that for you. So ready or not, he's coming. And I hope you're ready.